Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody. Thanks again for coming. This is our second workshop in our continuing series. And I was hoping that this would be more of an extension of what we talked about two weeks ago for functional connectivity. And before I begin, um, so like I mentioned in the email, I want to start to get a listserv just for the people who are interested in this. So I'm not spamming the, the entire scientist listserv. So just send me an email uh, so I can get a, a, a list of that. Also, the way that this has been going, or how I'm envisioning it, is that I'll give the lecture here. We'll do, hopefully, one or two exercises. And then these will be posted online on my website. And also, the videos will be up on YouTube. So both the ones that Don records, and I also make a separate tutorial video that's more condensed. All right? So if you have trouble finding those, let me know. I pointed to them in the last email, but if you can't find them, I'll find them out again. All right? So last, well, two Tuesdays ago, we talked about functional connectivity. And really how this was a fancy sounding name for a not very sophisticated analysis. In fact, I think this is easier to understand than task-based analyses. Because all we're doing in a functional connectivity analysis is pattern matching. So we're simply asking, does one voxel or set of voxels correlate with some seed region that we can find? And the seed region can be defined as a single voxel. It could be based on contrast. It could be a mask from some other study. It could be an anatomical mask. It's really up to you. And the good thing about our state connectivity analysis is that we can very reliably find these so-called uh, default mode networks, resting state networks. Default mode is one of them. There are other ones involved as well. There's like a reading network, supposedly, and there are a bunch of different networks which are pretty reliable in resting state analysis that you'd be able to find. Now, functional connectivity, uh, by and large, is best suited for <coughs> resting state data. Right? You can apply it to task-based analyses as well, but then there are other sources of variance that you're not necessarily accounting for, so it may not be best to do in a task <coughs> situation. You can still do it. No one's going to. Some people might complain. I'm not complaining. Now, context-dependent correlations, or PPIs, take this a step further. And the only extra step is using the same setup we had before. We're asking, does this voxel correlate with another voxel, or whatever our seed region is, only under certain conditions? So context-dependent correlations, they can only be done when there's an actual task involved, if you have a condition. The whole idea is, do we see any change in correlation, but only under condition A, as opposed to some other condition? So that's the whole deal there. The objectives today are to gain a greater understanding of what uh, PPI and GPPI are. GPPI is a generalized version of PPI. So once I explain the basics of PPI, GPPI is just a simple extension of that, which is being more and more used lately. So that's what we'll focus on. We'll learn how to do a GPPI in AFNI. And then we'll be trying in the exercises, among other things, trying different seed regions for the GPPI analysis. Let's take a look at what a PPI model actually looks like. I'm sure you're familiar with the whole y equals x1 times b1 plus x2 times b2. It's just multiple linear regression. We do the same thing with the PPI. But in a PPI, we have at least three distinct regressors that we're interested in. So the first one is going to be our so-called psychological variable. I should take a step back and say that I'm using the words PPI and context defect correlation interchangeably. They refer to the same thing. If you're on the acne message boards or the acne tutorials, they'll talk about it as a context defect correlation for the reasons I just outlined. The people who first developed this, the Carl Tristan Cabal, back in 1997, they call this a psychophysiological interaction, or PPI. The idea being that you have these three regressors. You have a psychological regressor that codes for the task, whether you're in one task versus another. You have a physiological variable, which is simply the time course of a given seed region. And then you have the interaction term, which is the product of these two variables. So it's really not that complicated. 
with the psychological uh, regress or what you're doing is you're coding for whether the condition is, let's say, on or they're in condition A or whether they're in the other condition. This is taken from, this is from the FSL documentation, but you can see that this dashed line right here, this represents zero, let's say. And a positive deflection is a one that codes for when you're in condition A, let's say, as opposed to condition B. And a negative deflection down here, that would be coded as a negative one, and that would tell you when you're in condition B. And a zero might be when you're, say, at rest or baseline or doing neither of the two. So what I want you to notice is that in this context, what you're going to find is that when you are, say, a positive inflection from zero, let's say condition A, and you multiply that by your physiological time series from the seed region, that thing's quite right. You're going to find that this is basically the exact same, right? This is going to be the same as this time series right here. Now, when you're in, when you're outside of that condition, let's say you're in the other condition, or you're being multiplied by negative one this is going to flip the sign of the time series. So as you're going up, it's going to be going down. And if you have a little bump down here, that's actually going to be a dip down there. Okay? So the idea is, in a simple functional connectivity analysis, we're just trying to correlate two time series together. Right? A context dependent correlation, it's not going to be looking for voxels which correlate all the time, going up and going down to the seed region. Only going up and going down during the task that you're interested in. Make sense? So this is the most important slide. If you understand this, you understand the whole concept behind P. Represented mathematically, here's what it's going to look like. Your GLM is going to be modified to look like this. You're going to have your contrast of, say, condition A, condition B. That's going to be multiplied by some beta weight. You're going to have your physiological regressor, which is simply your time series entered in. No convolution, just as is, multiplied by beta 2. And then you're going to take the interaction term of those two things, your psychological regressor and your physiological regressor, and then that's going to be weighted by some other beta. So those three things are accounting for different sources of variance. And it's very important to realize that this interaction term, it explains everything above and beyond both your physiological <coughs> term and your psychological term. Yeah? This is important because it shows how underpowered a PPI really is. If you've already regressed out the effect of task, you've regressed out the effect of the time series, you're not left with a whole lot left. Yeah. So keep that in mind when we're doing this. And then we have the error term, which is anything that can't be explained by your model. Now, there are a couple of different ways to approach this, about how to actually construct a PPI. One of the earlier papers by uh, Gittleman, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, back in 2003, argued that we're actually only interested in this interactions at the neural level. So all the signal that we're getting off the scanner, let's say you know, some time series we've extracted from some region, that is an effect of the gold signal, right? We're not actually measuring the underlying neural activity. So what you can do is actually deconvolve this into neural firing, which may seem a little black boxy, I like to say. I mean, how does it actually get there? There's some different tools you can use to actually do that. But the idea is we want to get it at the neural level before we make any sort of claim about a neural network, which PPI is trying to tap into. So you deconvolve your time series, you get the underlying neural activity, supposedly, and you simply multiply that by your psychological area. That gets you your interaction term. You reconvolve it with your gold signal, or your HRF, and you get this kind of interaction term right here. Okay? That's the, more, that's the fancier way to do it. That's more important in event-related designs. We're going to do a slightly different option in this workshop because it's simpler, but it's also an option. It may not be as precise, but it's still an option, and it still works very well with block voided designs. So in this case, what you would do is you would convolve your psychological regressor first with the HRF. That would account for any sort of lag, any sort of temporal, temporal blurring that you would see in the typical gold signal, and then you take that product and you multiply it 
by the time series. <coughs> you don't mess with the time series, you simply involve your psychological regression with the HRF. And then you get the resulting interaction journal. Both ways get to the same thing. If that way to design, you'd want to do the previous one, it's more involved, there's more steps, more assumptions. And if you actually believe that it's deconvolving your bull signal to neural firing, go ahead and do it. Packages like FSL don't do this, uh, SPM does do this, and AFNI, there's no default because there's no PPI button, so you gotta do it yourself. Now, GPPI. What I've outlined is a very simple case where you have one or two conditions at most. And the way PPI was done for the first 15 years or so, that's what they did. You would only have a contrast, which assumes that there are two conditions. You would have your physiological regressor and then the interaction term. So you'd have three regressors that would go into your model. But you may be asking, what if I have more than two conditions, which you know, virtually every task or the design, you would have more than two conditions, right? A simple two by two vectorial design, for example. In that case, a traditional PPI isn't modeling your entire search space. You're leaving out a lot of variants that could be explained by these other regressors, these other tasks. So this is where GPPI came in. This was uh, done by Donald McLaren. Does that name ring any bells for anybody? Donald McLaren, he is a, a listserv superhero for SPM. If you ever had to have an SPM question, he's the guy who always comes by first and answers it. So he's the expert on this, and he published a paper in 2012 showing that it's actually very easy and makes a lot of sense to do this GPPI approach. All you need to do is model a separate interaction term for each regressor. So what it would look like, say we just had two tasks, but you can expand this to however many number of tasks. Instead of simply modeling the, the contrast, you have the effect for task one and task two separately. The ROI time series as your physiological regressor. That hasn't changed. And then you model the interaction for task one by your physiological regressor and task two by your physiological regressor, plus your error term. So now, in the simple two condition study, you would have two interaction terms instead of one. At the end of the day, you can still take a contrast between these two and get what you would get with uh, a more traditional PPI analysis, but this is more precise and more precisely separates the variance attributable to each one. Okay. I don't have the equation for more than two tasks, but all you do is insert, say, task three, estimate a beta weight for it, and then the interaction of task three by the ROA time series, and estimate a beta for that. The steps of PPI, there is no difference in pre-processing between PPI and any other task-oriented design. Two weeks ago, sorry, I think it's water. Where's my water? Let's see. So, uh, two weeks ago, we had a couple of slightly different changes to a functional connectivity analysis for resting state, because it was resting state. We have things like bandpass filtering, we have stricter motion thresholds, now uh, we do despiking, for example, not things you necessarily do for a task related design. But PPI, if you've already pre-processed your task, don't change anything. All the changes that are going to come are at the general linear model level. And here's what it's going to look like in a typical AFNI 3D deconvolved script. So notice, let's say we only have two conditions. And in that sample data set I had you download, this is a very simple data set where there's an auditory task and there's a visual task and it's a block design. Pretty simple. You would still model the visual task, you would still model the auditory task, you would model out all your motion. The things that would change is you would have your C time series, your physiological regressor, and you would have an interaction term. If we're doing GPPI, there'll be two interaction terms, one for condition one and one for condition two. So everything in red is really the only thing that changes in your model. You leave everything else the same. All right, so we're going to get to a demo. I'm going to just show you on my screen what's going on. And then we'll open it up to a couple exercises that we'll be doing on our own. So did anybody have issues downloading, unpacking everything, running that, that, that basic uh, proc script? 
that came with it in. So, we're all good? All right. Awesome. Okay, I'm in AFNI data six, AFNI analysis, and I've already run those uh, two steps that I mentioned, so AFNI dot results. And what we're going to do here, make sure I have the right one. So there are two scripts also online, which I'll have you guys download. It's a second. So if you go to mypage.iu.edu, and then there's a tilde, A-J-A-H-N. If you go to the very bottom, uh, you have a copy of my slides. And then there are two scripts, one to prepare the PPI data, and one to run the PPI GLM. All right? Does anybody need me to have it up a little bit longer? Mypage.iu.edu backslash tilde, A-J-A-H-N at the very bottom. It's the one with the picture of me with champagne. <laughs> I, I really gotta change that. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. So take a second to download that. Uh, put that into your directory to ft.align. Two very simple SA scripts, and we'll take a look at those before we get started. So first, look at this one called PPI underscore prep dot SH. It may default open up with your Mac tools. The PPI prep, even though I said all the pre-processing is the same, we're going to be altering the timing files. Because remember, what I showed with the PPI analysis is that you can code your timing, your conditions, to show ones where it's active or on, and zeros when it's off, let's say. So we'll take that, convert it to a series of zeros and ones, and then we'll multiply that with your physiological time force. Notice we're not doing any deconvolution on our time force because this is a, a, a block design and it's really not going to have too much of an effect either way how we do it. If you haven't noticed, I'm stalling through time. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is opening up. Uh, man. So, so the deconvolution would mainly have the effect of shifting about like three or four seconds how that is weighted, right? Yeah, it's trying to show you like, the underlying neural activity, it's best estimate of what the underlying neural activity would be to give you that kind of time course. Yeah. So you see all these spikes at certain places, considering that you know, there's some kind of, uh, I guess, major firing at each of those time points leading to that, leading to this more smeared together time course. Okay. What's that? Need more time? No, 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 that's good. I mean, that's <laughs> it's a classic teaching technique. Let's demonstrate here. Uh, this PPI prep script, let me expand this a little bit. Can everybody read this, or at least it's on your, your screen? Okay, so timingtool.py. The few things that it needs, and you can adapt this for whatever kind of task assignment you have. You're going to be giving it your timing file, so for each one of those, you're going to have an option called timing to one d This means put it into ones and zeros. Ones where the task is on and zeros where the task is off. You give it your TR, you give it the stimulus duration, which in this case, it's a block design. So in seconds, it's going to be 20 seconds. And then the run length for each run. So if you took a look at each one of those 
timing files, you notice that each one is on a separate row. So you need to give it the actual time in seconds for each of those runs. Same thing for your other regressor as well. Once you have those, you're going to involve them with ones and zeros with the canonical HRF. Okay, so this command waiver, you can give it a certain basis function, in this case a gamma basis function. What your TR is, a peak of one is, is standard, it's kind of like default. And then you're going to be giving it your timing files, which have been turned into zeros and ones. Okay, so let's take a look at what that would look like. Line that results, and within this, I'm going to copy in my PPI prep and my PPI key. I'm going to copy that both into this directory. So if I look at PPI prep, I'll see all those commands I just outlined, and if I run it using TCSH, PPI underscore prep. It'll do a few things on the same script. It's going to be doing that conversion of the timing files I talked about. It's also going to create a mask in one of the regions and extract the time series from it. But the output I want to focus on are, so there's AV1 underscore TMP and AV1 underscore uh, So if I take a look at say uh, 1D plot AV1 underscore TMP, so here's what it looks like now put into zeros and ones. So it's ones wherever that task was on, and it's going to be zeros or shut off whenever the task wasn't occurring. Now we're using the option where we're just convolving the psychological regressor. And we're not doing anything with the physiological regressor. The output of that is AB1 underscore convolved. And as you see, now it has a little bit smoother edges. It takes those ones and zeros, and it makes it look more like, a, say, a waveform, as opposed to a rectangle or a spike. So that's all that part of the script actually did. Now, the second part was we actually created an ROI, and we extracted from that ROI to create our physiological regressor. So first thing I like to do, this is something that I just made for you. I took the coordinates in the visual cortex and extracted them, created an ROI for it but you can create your own. So first of all, I'm going to make sure that this ROI actually is where I wanted it to be. That's always a good step to follow. And this one I've simply called ROI. So I look at it, yes, this is in the visual cortex. That's where I'm extracting the time series from. That all looks good. And the name of this time series is called ROI underscore TS. So again, I'm just looking at all these to make sure everything looks fine and nothing looks too crazy. So notice this is taken from a data set where the, the time series has been normalized to be all deflections from 100. So everything is relative to 100, ostensibly so you can talk about it in terms of percent signal change. So that's why there's nothing that looks as spiky or variable as you would see in raw, a raw time series time course, but that's fine. As long as we see some reasonable variation, and it will look like if we expanded this, it would look like a typical ROI time course. Now, the last result from this, as you can see, these last two things right here, we have two interaction terms like I was talking about for the PPI analysis. There's the ROI multiplied by my first psychological regressor and the ROI time series multiplied by my second time series regressor. Now, these, this is a block design, so it's not going to look too much different from the convolved psychological regressor. But you can see that there actually is a little bit of variation in the spikes here. right? So in each of these, there's going to be a little bit of variation because it's been multiplied by the time course. 
And if you did this with your event-weighted time series, you would actually see a lot more variation because the way it's been deconvolved and reconvolved, you should see a lot more, uh, a lot more difference between those two. But in this case, it should look the same, but a little bit of variation in each of those peaks. Okay. Good so far. Any questions? So I just showed you in AFNI commands everything we've done for PPI up until this point. So the next thing is going to be actually running the GLM. And here's the part where we actually have to do the most. So here, the script has already been uh, done for you. Notice, the only things that I'm changing here, I'm leaving in my tasks. I'm leaving in the visual task and the auditory condition. Right? Not really tasks, they weren't really doing anything, but either seeing something or hearing something. And those are modeled as it would normally be in a task rate design. The only things that have changed are these three things right here. Okay, but these things right here, this time series, this ROI time series, and also the interaction insurance for the ROI with each of my psychological regressors. Those are the only three things that have really changed. Yeah. Everything else is the same. We have our motion regressors, it's all fine. And then we still write out everything like our T statistics, our design matrices, fit time series, error time series, whatever you want, that's all fine. So go ahead and run this, ppi underscore dcon.sh. And note that it's really not that difficult to apply this to any task, really. You'd just be adding in more regressors, you'd be making more regressors, obviously, but it wouldn't take that much time. The only thing that would be a big time sink, that would take a lot of time, would be if you have a new seed time series. Right? Say now you're not interested in the visual cortex, you're interested in some other ones. Well, you're going to have to create all your regressors over again. But using that script, it shouldn't take too long. So just be aware of that. I've used ROI as a placeholder for the time series, but if you want something that's more descriptive, go ahead and use that. Now, as opposed to our functional connectivity analysis where we got a correlation map, these are not really correlation maps. They're related to correlation, but they're interaction terms. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So while this is loading, let me ask you guys a question. Would you expect to see a significant psychophysiological interaction within that time series or within the ROI that I created? Why or why not? Let me put it this way. In the functional connectivity, when you extract it from a, an ROI, <coughs> you correlated that with every part else in the brain, it was a sure thing that your ROI was going to be very, very significant or have a high correlation. Because that's how you define the correlation. Right? But in a PPI, would you see the same thing? Why not? Yeah, good point. So yeah, we already put the regressor with the ROI time series in the model. And also, I would add to that, by definition, a PPI isn't looking for any voxels that are correlated with that time series perfectly. So it almost kind of biases you away from finding a significant PPI within that C region. So if you understand that, you have a more intuitive understanding about what PPIs are doing. So let's go here, and now with skull warped, because this is all in tire X space right now. And I also masked it as part of the, uh, the deconvolution, which you can remove that if you want. And let's see here. Stats underscore PPI is always output. So notice here, what you have in your output is going to be your main effect of, say, visual which, not surprisingly, that should be most significant in, say, uh, visual cortex. I'm changing my defaults just to make this look you know, relatively reasonable. OK, so visual effect, yeah, it's in the visual cortex. That's fine. Now, the things we're really interested in are these interaction terms. Right. This is a very contrived data set. I'm not expecting to find any meaningful PPI in this data set. And honestly, I couldn't find a good one that would lend itself well to doing a PPI. Uh, SPM has a, 
their own PPI data set, but that's MATLAB, so um, all their scripts are MATLAB. I guess I could use that, but you know, who can trust them? <laughs> SPM people, yeah. whatever. Also, if you weren't here last time, we're being recorded, so whatever you say about <laughs> anybody, just realize you know it'll be up online. So. Uh, yeah. All right. So this is our interaction term for our ROI time series, which was a C defined, defined in the visual cortex, multiplied by uh, the visual condition, right? So the interpretation of this, we'll get more to this in a little bit, but the interpretation could be that any voxels that I'm seeing that are significant show voxels which are significantly correlated with that visual time series only under conditions where the visual task was on or off. So again, I'm, I'm playing around with threshold thresholds just to show which ones are actually, say, positive. Uh, the actual underlying beta weights are very, very small, which is why. Okay, so recall that my uh, seed time course was about right here. Okay, it's, again, we're not really seeing anything over there. Uh, maybe I'll threshold this a little bit. Say 0.01. Sounds good. So if I try to find a significant cluster of cluster hunting, maybe I see something in the more, say, rostral anterior cingulate, for example. So one interpretation could be, all right, uh, so I have this visual time series, and I'm seeing a significant correlation between that time series and this voxel within the rostral cingulate cortex, only under conditions when they're in the visual task. Right? So that's one possible interpretation. Now, as I mentioned, PPIs, they suffer power issues. Usually you'll see, you'd be seeing a lot of false positives, so, you know, use your, you know, whatever typical conservative uh, corrections you use because you want to make sure that you're not, not getting beguiled by false positives. But this is the PPI analysis. Again, pre-processing the same. We modify the timing files. We create some interaction terms. We put those into a convolution script. 3D deconvolved script, and here's the output, and here's what it looks like. Yeah. These are beta maps, so you can just take these, no need to convert them to Z maps like we did before, correlations, and you can feed these uh, beta maps into a second level t test. Yeah? Questions? So I'm going to go back to a few more slides and we'll do some exercises. But this is all I want to show on my screen with what's going on with, with the PPI. Back to the slides. Hope that was somewhat informative. I already started talking about this, but interpreting PPIs, there are a couple different ways that you can do this. Oh, you can turn it. So if you have a significant PPI, there can actually be three possible interpretations of what's going on. One is that the seed region modulates the effect of the condition on other boxes. So in other words, I had uh, you know, my visual series time course. And somehow that's interacting with this more frontal region, but it's only doing so because of the visual condition that's in somehow. Again, all this interpretation is up to you. It can't be definitively proved by your PPI. A second plausible interpretation is that the condition that you're in is the thing that is modifying the strength of the connection between the two time courses. So maybe it would have been that, you know, there'd be no correlation between them, but since you're in the visual condition, it's bumping up the correlation between them because they're communicating somehow. Or they need to communicate to process visual information in this case. Or it could be that it's both one and two. A PPI does not really give you any sense of directionality. Yeah? It's a regression, and so it, it really can't answer that. What about if it's positive or negative? What, right. How, how many of that? Mm -hmm. So if it's a positive PPI, that means that the correlation is being, uh, it's mostly positively correlated. If it's negative, then it's mostly anti-correlated. But only under that condition, you see a really strong anti-correlation. So that's what the negative voxels would be. So you could say, so like it was, let's say, number two. So that particular condition would decrease the strength of the correlation between the, the, the C region and 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when I say decrease, when, so I'd be careful about saying decrease. I mean, if it's leading to a strong anti-correlation, that's also yeah. really interesting. Okay. If it's like just decreasing it towards zero, then it's, right. it's probably not, uh, okay. I would say it's maybe not doing anything, but that's another question. If you find something that's selectively just killing a correlation, and just making it zero or not significant, mm -hmm. I don't think that this would allow you to detect that. Okay. But actually eliciting a strong anti-correlation, that's definitely something you could do. Okay. That it could tell you. So that's what the negative voxels would tell you as a result. All right. So those are the interpretations. Again, this almost forces you to be uh, a good scientist because you have to actually have like, <laughs> that's what that happens. You have to have like a compelling reason for doing it in the first place. And w one thing that, that just drives me nuts and I'm, you know, I'm going to talk to the camera here for a second, but what I see a lot of times happening is that the PPI results that I'll see sometimes, it'll be you know the, like a few loosely connected voxels, and they'll say they'll slap a, a small volume correction on it. They'll say, oh yeah, like of course we thought that we're going to see it in, in this place. And it, you know, they're kind of giving the show away because first of all, this thing is severely underpowered, and it, it has a smell, right? I mean, if, if you don't have a compelling reason for why you would see that in the first place, it's much, it's much fishier. I mean, I'm not saying that a lot of the interpretations I see for main effects is that great either, but PPI is especially tricky because these effects are so small. So like I said, the interpretations are ambiguous. Any of those three interpretations could be valid. It really depends on your, your experimental context, what you're trying to answer. And what do you think a plausible explanation might be? It could be because you know, you know the literature really well about how these things affect connectivity or what, what's connected to what. Second caveat, low power. You're regressing out your task. You're regressing out the signal in that area. It's trying to explain everything above and beyond those two things. So if you're already regressing those two things out, there's not a lot of variance left especially if you're doing a GPPI, right? That's more accurate, you're, you're explaining more things, you're exploring all the search space. And now whatever's left over, I mean, it would have to be a very, very strong correlation only under certain conditions for that to hold. And lastly, there's no directionality. Some people say that there's an implicit directionality. I've never been convinced that there actually is. Some people put this under the category as effective connectivity. I don't think it's the effect of connectivity because from a regression, you can't really say that one thing is driving another. It's one regression model. It's not necessarily constrained. Yes, you're defining a seek region, but it could just as well be that, you know, the, the so-called target region that you're finding is influencing the, the other region. I mean, how can you tell just by doing the PPI as a setup? You can't. Somebody may be able to convince me otherwise, but I haven't seen anything that really suggest that. Okay, so that being said, in our last 15 minutes, I'd like to just do a couple exercises. I may shut up for a little bit. Uh, there are four of them I'm going to go through. I think that the last two are really for you on your own because they're, they're much more involved and they're required to do things like PPI for all of your subjects. So the first one, uh, we have these interaction terms and one thing you'll want to do after you've done this Either, there are two options that you can do. Um, I'm going to recommend using 3D calc, but you can also use the GLM with GLT sim if you're so inclined. What I'd like you to do with the things that we just created is to use 3D calc, use this command right here, to take a contrast between those interaction terms. This will give you that interaction of the contrast term that I outlined in the first few slides of the talk. The so-called traditional PPI analysis, we just have the contrast term, the physiological term and then the interaction between those two. So open up your terminals. And first of all, type 3 info on the stats output from that PPI analysis to get a sense of which subrics correspond to what part or what beta of your output. And once you've done that, you can do 3D calc. The prefix can be whatever you want. I've called this the interaction between those two conditions.
specify your stats and subgrips. So in the case of uh, AB1, which was the visual condition, and AB2, which was the auditory condition. Subric 7 is going to be the beta weight, or the coefficient subric for that, and 9 is going to be the coefficient subric for auditory. Okay. So common mistake, uh, don't, don't contrast the T statistics. You, depending on what you output in your 3D convolved script, you can output your just the beta weights, you can output the T statistics, usually those two are the, the default. Or you can modif you can output uh, F statistics as well. So just check to make sure. What you should what you should see in 3D evolve from the output of it is it'll give you what the label is. So it'll say this is the coefficient one, this is the T stat, this is the F stat, and be aware of what corresponds to what. Once you get that output, this contrast between them, you can load it up in Athena, you can overlay this map. Um, it's not going to be terribly informative because these values are very, very low. So you have to make a threshold very low to make any sort of sense out of it. Uh, the benefit of including it as a GLT sim option is because that will output also a T statistic, and then you can threshold it by the T statistic, which may be more informative. But ultimately, you're just going to be using these beta weights either just from the uh, simple effects of each condition or from the contrast between the condition, you're going to be feeding that into a second level t-test if you want to see whether there's an actual change in PPI at the group level. So as I was talking to you, you probably should have had time to finish that. Uh, any questions about that output? Any, any problems so far? Well, let me put it this way. If you guys had to adapt any of these scripts for your data? Any questions that you, you can think of right now for anything that we might want to modify? I'm going to go through one more thing which, which may uh, you know, be more germane to what you're doing. Okay, good. Um, I'm trying to think if I should mention this or not. I'll go ahead and mention it. This is all hearsay, but apparently the, P, the uh, PPI group, the AFNI group, they don't look too fair, favorably upon doing PPI analyses for a lot of the reasons I just outlined. Um, I'm not saying that it's it's a completely worthless endeavor, but I'm saying that if if you're just going into a PPI analysis because you're like, what the hell, I may as well do it because nothing else is working out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to guarantee you that you're going to be disappointed unless you try some really shady techniques to try to like squeeze a result out of it. So this is a great thing to think about if you're setting up an experiment and you're thinking, you know, I have a really strong prediction about why I would find PPI in this particular area. That, that, that's great. You would get a ton of impact if you did this, right? And if it worked out, that would be, that'd be great. But the, the consensus seems to be that you know, even doing all the fanciest new techniques for you know, cleaning up your data, making sure it's going to be really good for a PPI analysis, it's very hard to get a result out of it. Trey's the reason I said it. <laughs> it's his fault. You primed me. You made me. You made me so discouraged. But, but, uh, that's a good technique to know and to uh, to wield. Okay, so the second thing there's a little bit more involved. Uh, this is up to you. So what I want you guys to do is to open up AFNI, open up your warped anatomical image, select your favorite region. It could be Broca's area. It could be the singular cortex. I don't know, whatever. It could be something you think looks kind of funny. Uh, which has like a, a crazy name, like retro splenial singular cortex. It's crazy, right? I mean, those are funny names. So just select something, note the coordinates of it. And then uh, using, I, I forget which line of code it was, I'll, I'll exit out of this in a second, but just modify one of the, the lines in, it's the 3D undump command in that PPI prep script. Just modify that, input the coordinates of that place that you think uh, may be interesting, feed that into that script, and then rerun your PPI analysis to see what happens, <laughs> see, see if the result for any reason makes sense. 
Uh, but it's a good exercise to get you to, uh, first of all, use this, I, I want to call it like a template script for your purposes, and try it with, say, one or two different C regions. So, yeah, Jeff. Uh, are the, uh, the coordinates in RAI in the script that you have? Yes. So, what I have in the script, I'll get out of this. That's something for another workshop. Why are coordinates in is so messed up? <laughs> Nobody knows, nobody can answer it. Um, remember a post by Ziad? Uh, and he's not working that happy anymore. With it. But he said, like, you know, th this is the this is the post which is gonna like solve all the all the controversy about that. Did not help me at all. Maybe I just like I just didn't understand. But it's still it's still kind of confusing. In the script, what I'm gonna to point to is PPI underscore prep. Okay, so the, the, the thing that you can modify, this is really a general purpose extraction tool, extracting the, the time series for anything. Uh, these coordinates, negative 5, 90, negative 10, how did I get those? Um, if you open up Avenue and uh, I underlay my warped anatomical image, Okay, so the way that I got there, if I go to jump to X, Y, Z, was it negative 5, 90, negative 10? Okay, so the reason I got there was I just clicked on that area beforehand, and then I noted that these three uh, coordinates right here. Okay, so notice that it almost seems like it's a little backwards. Something to the right is actually negative. Uh, the Y is positive when you think it should be negative in Tyrex space, and Z is actually the same in both cases. But uh, just be aware of that because when I'm using, when I'm specifying my master data set, it assumes that these are, this is the orientation that it's going to use. Okay. So that's the way that I use it. If I have a, a say, set of Tallyrack coordinates from some other paper, usually what I'll do instead of jumping through some hoops is I'll just flip the signs of the x and the y coordinates, and then input that into my 3D undone command. So at the end of the day, it, just make sure that it's in the, sp in the spot where you think it should be. And just note that Avni is a little bit weird. You, you can change the defaults, that's definitely an option. That may be a good thing to do, but for anybody just installing Avni who's new to it, this is what it's going to look like. So select something, it could be this. Whatever that, I mean, that's not really hippocampus. If it's not over here, I don't know what it is. It could be single cortex, could be frontal pole, what have you. But just to give you a sense of how to do that. Okay. So just take a minute or two. Um, as you guys are doing that, the next time we're going to meet is in two weeks. Yeah? Um, what I had scheduled. was um, it's an introduction to a relatively new technique which is supposed to detect uh, sub-threshold clusters. It looks for the overlap between the number of subjects, uh, significant voxels, or I think you can threshold them on a certain, uh, some other scale or something. But basically it's looking more for overlap and not necessarily, um, basically it's trying to attenuate the effect of outliers. So it may be good if you have a data set that has a lot of variability for whatever reason you think uh, a few bad apples may be totally throwing off your t-stat. Um, I had a link to the paper in the, in the very first schedule that I, I sent out. So we could do that in a couple weeks. If we wanted to have some more continuity with this connectivity business, uh, we also could do something called beta series correlation, which is a very useful connectivity technique. I think a lot of people around here use it. You know, be a review for some people. You may learn a few new things. Um, so, show of hands, who would be interested in the beta series correlation to continue these tutorials? Okay, so a fair amount. Um, I, I mean, that's the majority. Whatever. I'm not going to take another one. Uh, okay, so so here's my idea. So we'll we'll do we'll kind of like round out the the functional connectivity course with, with, uh, with beta series. 
If you have any specific things you want to talk about beforehand, email me. And then the very last one, instead of being MVPA, will be about this, this overlap technique that came out in, I think it was Nature. Yeah. I'll have to go back because I understood it a lot when I was reading it, but <laughs> I forgot a lot about it. It was it was pretty interesting. It, mainly the punchline was, um, you know, T statistics can be, you know, pretty wildly driven by by outliers, right? Somebody has like a beta weight of eight, and somebody yeah. everybody else is like, you know, around one. Yeah, that can that can really affect things. And it was a way to. Um, look at the overlap, I think, in, in, in each individual subject's team map. And then from that, calculate some other statistic. Yeah. And it hasn't gotten a lot of press, but it, it was interesting enough. Somebody, some, one of my readers brought to my attention and wanted uh, to look into it. So I figured, you know, it's, there's more of a topical my seminar, why not? We'll definitely cover it before the end of the year. Okay. Uh, any questions before we break? I'm still trying to keep this all at one hour. Yeah. Even the issue of the low power or the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have any reason against to use simply the interaction with the rest? And without it not putting it to Well, you want to you want to control for a, a potential confound, which could be the effective task. That's right. So that's the so reason why that we have it. Right. Yeah, but then the problem with that. So the question is, if you want to increase power, why not leave out the psychological term, which is the effective task? And the issue with that is then any significant peak guy result you see may be driven solely because there's a greater difference between the two tasks, and not necessarily because the correlation is being Wait, but going uh, up. With the GPPM, so we only put one for the uh, text, right? and, A, and mm -hmm. it, another minus one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not taking the contrast, but it's still modeling the amplitude of each of the, the tasks. Also. It's not ideal, but man, that's, that's the way it's set up, and correspondingly. Any shared variances, or any variances left over is what we're trying to soak up. Yeah, yeah Jeff. Uh, just when you're defining ROIs for doing this, like you know, I know there's a large concern as far as like circularity. Yeah, yeah. If you do a standard activation-based yeah. analysis, is it appropriate to then choose one of those as your seed region for PPI? This is one of the conditions where it is appropriate, okay. actually, because again, because we're modeling out the effective task. Uh, it should, anything else that we find outside of that should be orthogonal to that, yeah. And in the O'Reilly paper, she, she specifies why, why that's fine. So this is a case where we definitely can use a contrast map as you see it. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, again, this, I'll try to make sure this is up as soon as possible. Um, again, uh, it took, I, I think maybe at the beginning of next week is when I'll have the DVD of, of this of this lecture. Um, over the weekend I'm going to try to put up you know, the, the more condensed version that, that goes through the steps linearly. Maybe ambitious, but that, that's my plan. So I have that for Thanksgiving. Wish all your friends. Are you going to, are you going to Annie's? Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I uh, hope to see you in two weeks. Again, any questions, email me. If you want to be on the listserv for uh, our club, I don't know if you call it, call it <laughs> uh, please email me. And you'll only get updates about this from the listserv. Okay, thanks guys.